And that class concludes our theoretical overview of death world of physiology, Professor Zilk Snacks announced, his gelatinous form rippling with what passed for excitement among the globins. Any questions before we move on to the practical demonstration? A tentacle shot up from the back of the classroom. It belonged to Blurp, the class clown and perpetual troublemaker. Yeah, Prof. When are we going to see some real action? I mean, come on, these death worlders can't be as tough as all that, right? Snort, they're probably just a bunch of squishy losers who got lucky with evolution. The class erupted in a cacophony of chittering laughter, squeaks and gurgles the alien equivalent of a laugh track on a bad sitcom. Professor Zilk's Nax's epidermis flushed a deep purple, a sign of both embarrassment and annoyance. I assure you, Blurp, that death worlders are not to be underestimated. Their homeworld, Earth, is a nightmarish hellscape of environmental extremes, deadly predators, and constant planetary upheaval. The fact that they not only survived but thrived in such conditions is a testament to their resilience. Just then, the classroom door swished open, and in walked, or rather, lumbered the subject of their discussion. Jake Martinez, the only human exchange student at Galactic University, ducked his head to avoid smacking it on the doorframe again and sheepishly made his way to his desk. Sorry I'm late, Professor Jake mumbled, his face flushing red. I, uh, had a little accident in the cafeteria. Professor Zilk Snacks's eye stalks swiveled towards Jake, taking in the human's dishevelled appearance. Good gracious, Mr. Martinez, what happened to you? Jake chuckled nervously, running a hand through his hair. Well, you see, I was trying to get some of that delicious Centaurian plasma jelly, but the dispenser was jammed. So I gave it a little tap, and... Senarche. The whole thing kind of exploded. He turns out, Centaurian plasma jelly doesn't react well to human skin oils. Who knew, right? The class stared at Jake in a mixture of horror and fascination. His skin was covered in small, angry-looking welts, and wisps of smoke still curled up from his singed eyebrows. Blurb, never one to miss an opportunity, piped up again. Ha, ah, some invincible death worlder you are, taken down by a dessert. Snort, maybe we should rename your species to Jelly World. Blurp's taunting was cut short as Jake, in his haste to sit down and escape the attention, misjudged the strength needed to pull out his chair. The reinforced alloy seat, designed to withstand the weight of species far denser than humans, went flying across the room. It embedded itself in the wall with a resounding clang, mere millimetres from Blurp's quivering form. Silence fell over the classroom, broken only by the soft tink-tink-tink tink of the chair slowly working its way out of the wall and clattering to the floor. I, uh... Oops, Jake offered weakly, a nervous grin spreading across his face. Professor Zilk Snacks's gelatinous body pulsed rapidly, a clear sign of distress. Classy burbled, I believe we've found our volunteer for today's practical demonstration. Jake's eyes widened. Demonstration? What demonstra? Before he could finish his question, a transparent force field bubble materialized around him, lifting him off the ground. Jake yelped in surprise, his limbs flailing comically as he tried to regain his balance in the suddenly gravity-free environment. Now, class professor Zilk Snacks began, his tone taking on the enthusiasm of a mad scientist, we're going to observe how a death worlder responds to various environmental stresses. Let's start with something simple, shall we? Computer, begin scenario one extreme temperature fluctuations. Jake's bubble began to glow an ominous red, Sweat immediately beaded on his forehead as the temperature inside skyrocketed. Uh, Professor? Is this really Ness's Y-O-W-C-H? He hopped from foot to foot as the floor of the bubble heated up. Hot. 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 The class watched in fascination as Jake did an impromptu dance, reminiscent of a human ritual they'd seen in entertainment vids called the Funky Chicken. Just as Jake thought he couldn't take any more, the bubble suddenly turned a frosty blue. The temperature plummeted, and Jake's sweat froze instantly on his skin. TTT Toasty Jake chattered, hugging himself and bouncing in place to keep warm. His breath came out in visible puffs, quickly forming a small cloud inside the bubble. Professor Zilk Snacks's eye stalks quivered with excitement. Fascinating. Note how quickly the subject adapts to the changing conditions. This ability to withstand rapid temperature shifts is a hallmark of death world of physiology. Now, Let's move on to scenario two atmospheric pressure variations. The bubble around Jake began to shrink, compressing the air inside. 
Jake's eyes bulged comically as the pressure increased, his cheeks puffing out like a chipmunk's. Just when it seemed his eyeballs might pop right out of his skull, the bubble expanded rapidly, creating a sudden vacuum. Hoor Jake exclaimed, his voice high and squeaky in the thin air. He flailed his arms, trying to stay grounded as he began to float. I feel like I'm back in that anti-grav chamber at space camp. He, minus the whole not being able to breathe thing, of course. Blurp, having recovered some of his bravado, sneered at Jake's predicament. Ha! Look at the mighty death worlder now. Floating around like a lost nebula fart. Jake, still bobbing in the low-pressure environment, managed to shoot Blurp a withering glare. You know, wheeze on earth we have a saying I'd rather be a lost nebula fart than a... gasp. Then are you okay? I can't think of a good comeback right now because my brain's not getting enough oxygen, but trust me, it would have been devastating. Professor Zilk Snacks, oblivious to the exchange, continued his lecture. Observe how the subject maintains consciousness even under extreme pressure differentials. This adaptability is what allows deathworlders to explore environments that would be instantly fatal to most species. Now, let's proceed to scenario 3 gravitational stress. The bubble reset to normal atmospheric conditions, much to Jake's relief. However, his respite was short-lived as he suddenly felt an immense weight pressing down on him. The artificial gravity in the bubble had been cranked up to eleven. Jake grunted with effort, his knees buckling under the intense gravitational pull. Un. Is this, huff, what it feels like? To be. Sat on. By a Jovian whale shark, despite the strain, Jake managed to slowly straighten up, his muscles quivering with exertion. The class watched in awe as Jake, red-faced and sweating, began to adapt to the crushing gravity. He took one shaky step, then another, moving around the bubble with increasing confidence. Remarkable Professor Zilk Snacks exclaimed. The subject is displaying adaptive musculature and skeletal reinforcement in real time. This is precisely why deathworlders are so valued in high-gravity mining operations and... crack. The sound of splintering alloy filled the air as the floor beneath Jake's bubble began to give way under the intense gravitational force. Before anyone could react, the floor collapsed entirely, sending Jake and his bubble plummeting through to the classroom below. Pandemonium erupted as students rushed to the hole, peering down to see what had become of their death world a guinea pig. Through the settling dust and debris, they could make out Jake's bubble, miraculously intact, resting in the middle of what used to be Professor Yggdrasil's cosmic botany lecture. Jake's voice drifted up from below, tinged with equal parts pain and amusement. A uh, little help down here. I think I just gave a whole new meaning to the phrase drop in lecture a wheezing laugh followed, punctuated by a groan. Oh man, I think I landed on a Venusian throttle vine. It's... Urk. Living up to its name. Professor Zilk Snacks's gelatinous form quivered with a mixture of concern and scientific excitement. Class, it seems we've stumbled upon an impromptu scenario for impact resistance and regeneration. Quickly, take notes. This is a rare opportunity to observe Deathworlder recovery in action. As the students scrambled for their data pads, a commotion arose from the hole in the floor. Jake's bubble, still active, floated back up through the opening, carrying not only the battered but grinning human but also a very irate Professor Yggdrasil, whose branch-like limbs were tangled around the sphere. What is the meaning of this Professor Yggdrasil bellowed, his leaf-like appendages rustling furiously? I was in the middle of a delicate discussion on the mating habits of Aldebaran strangler figs. Jake, still trapped in the bubble with the enraged botanical professor, tried his best to look contrite. Sorry about that, Prof. If it helps, I think I've got first-hand experience with those strangler figs now. There... Uh, very friendly. Professor Zilk Snacks's eye stalks drooped in embarrassment. My sincerest apologies, Professor Yggdrasil. We were conducting a practical demonstration on death world of physiology, and it seems things got a bit... out of hand. Out of hand, Yggdrasil sputtered, his bark like skin flushing a deep mahogany. You've turned my lecture hall into a crater. And this... This primate has traumatized my prized plutonian pulsating pitcher plant. Look at it. He gestured to a trembling, pitcher-shaped organism that was trying to hide behind a fallen desk. Jake, despite his predicament, couldn't help but chuckle. Oh, come on, it's not that bad. I think it likes me. See, he waved at the plant, which responded by emitting a high-pitched shriek and spewing a jet of fluorescent liquid. 
Okay, maybe not. Professor Zilk Snacks, desperate to regain control of the situation, cleared his throat, or what passed for a throat in Goblin Anatomy. Perhaps we should continue our demonstration in a more controlled environment. Computer, initiate emergency containment protocol Omega-3. The bubble containing Jake and Professor Yggdrasil suddenly expanded, engulfing the entire classroom. Students found themselves floating alongside desks, data pads and various bits of classroom debris. Oh, come on, Blurp wailed, his tentacles flailing uselessly in the zero-gravity environment. This is all your fault, you stupid death worlder. Jake, now free-floating alongside the still-fuming Professor Yggdrasil, couldn't help but grin. Hey, look on the bright side, Blurp. At least you're finally taller than everyone else in the class. A ripple of laughter spread through the floating students, punctuated by Blurp's indignant sputtering. Even Professor Yggdrasil's leaves twitched in what might have been amusement. Professor Zilksnacks, realizing he had lost all semblance of control over his lesson, decided to embrace the chaos. Well, class, it seems we've inadvertently created a new scenario adaptation to unexpected microgravity environments. Mr. Martinez, since you seem to be enjoying this impromptu field trip, perhaps you'd like to share some insights on how death worlders handle such situations. Jake, performing a lazy backflip, nodded enthusiastically. Sure thing, Prof. Well, first off, you've got to remember the most important rule of zero G. Never eat the floating meatballs, he paused, looking thoughtful. Actually, that might just be a rule for the International Space Station. But it probably applies here, too. As Jake launched into a rambling explanation of zero-gravity etiquette, peppered with dubious facts and outrageous anecdotes, something remarkable began to happen. The alien students, initially annoyed or frightened by the situation, started to relax. They experimented with moving in the weightless environment, laughing at their clumsy attempts and marvelling at the strange sensations, Professor Yggdrasil, his initial anger fading, found himself engaged in an impromptu lecture on the effects of microgravity on plant growth, using the floating debris as visual aids. Even Blurp, the perpetual naysayer, was grudgingly impressed when Jake showed him how to use gentle puffs of air to manoeuvre. As the afternoon wore on, the accidental zero-gravity classroom became a hub of interspecies collaboration and learning. Students from different biological backgrounds shared their unique perspectives on adapting to extreme environments. Jake, drawing on his vast experience from watching old sci-fi movies, demonstrated the fine art of zero-g acrobatics with only minimal collisions. Finally, as the ship's artificial day cycle began to wane, the computer announced the end of the containment protocol. The bubble dissolved, and everyone gently floated back to the floor, or what was left of it. Professor Zilk Snacks, his gelatinous form quivering with a mixture of exhaustion and exhilaration, addressed the class. Well, students, I think it's safe to say that this has been the most unconventional lesson in the history of Galactic University. While it wasn't quite the controlled demonstration I had planned, I believe we've all learned something valuable about adaptability, resilience, and the unexpected benefits of property damage. Jake, his hair sticking up in all directions and a broad grin on his face, chimed in. Yeah, and we learned that death worlders are secretly invincible. Well, maybe not invincible, but definitely bouncy. And fire-resistant. And really, really good at impromptu zero-gravity ballet. The class erupted in laughter and appreciative chirps, whistles and gurgles. Even Blurp, trying hard to maintain his grumpy demeanour, couldn't help but let out a reluctant chuckle. As the students began to file out, chattering excitedly about their adventure, Professor Zilk Snacks pulled Jake aside. Mr. Martinez, while I can't condone the extensive remodeling of our facilities, I must admit that your unique death world of perspective has brought an unexpected dimension to our studies. Perhaps you'd be interested in co-teaching a seminar on practical xenobiology. Jake's eyes lit up. Are you kidding? I'd love to. I've got so many ideas already. How about surviving a black hole a death world as guide to extreme spaghettification? or maybe diplomatic dining how to eat alien cuisine without becoming the main course. Professor Zilk Snacks' eye stalks drooped slightly. Perhaps we should start with something a bit more. Academic. And less likely to cause an interstellar incident. Fair enough, Jake conceded. But can we at least do one lesson on the xenobiological importance of high fives? I've been dying to teach that one. As they left the demolished classroom, Jake's enthusiastic planning echoing down the hallway, 
Professor Zilk Snacks couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and trepidation. One thing was certain with the Death Welder as a teaching assistant. The upcoming semester was going to be anything but boring. And somewhere in the depths of Galactic University, a plutonian pulsating pitcher plant huddled in a corner, wondering what it had done to deserve such an education. The next day, news of the Death Welder disaster, as it was dramatically dubbed by the campus news feed, had spread across Galactic University faster than a Quillian quantum virus. Jake found himself the centre of attention as he made his way to the cafeteria, alien students of all shapes and sizes gawking at him, as if he'd grown a second head which, given the events of yesterday, some of them probably expected him to do. Hey, Death Welder, a voice called out. Jake turned to see Zlorbax, a Vesuvian exchange student whose rocky exoskeleton clinked with every movement. Is it true you survived a gravity crush that would turn most beings into subatomic particles? Jake grinned, unable to resist the temptation to embellish just a little. Oh yeah, it was intense. At one point I think I saw my own skeleton trying to escape through my skin. But you know us death worlders, we're basically walking, talking black holes. Gravity's more of a suggestion than a law for us. A collective ooh rippled through the growing crowd of onlookers. Jake couldn't help but notice that while some students were keeping a respectful or fearful distance, others were inching closer, fascination overcoming their initial wariness. As Jake reached for a tray, a gelatinous appendage suddenly slapped his hand away. He looked up to see Glupik, the cafeteria's head chef, quivering with what appeared to be a mixture of fear and indignation. No, 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 Glupik burbled, his translucent body flashing warning colours. You no touch food dispensers. Not after yesterday's plasma jelly incident. Glupik not want entire cafeteria go boom. Jake raised his hands in surrender, trying to look as non-threatening as possible, which, given his newfound reputation, was about as effective as a Tsar Blaxian tooth beast trying to pass as a therapy animal. Whoa, easy there, chef. I promise I'll keep my apparently highly volatile hands to myself. But, uh, guys gotta eat, you know. You know, even invincible death welders need fuel. Glupik's eye stalks swiveled in thought before he let out a resigned gurgle. Fine, you sit. Glupik bring food. Special death welder menu. Guaranteed not explode. Probably. As Jake made his way to a table, tray laden with what looked like a cross between a sentient lava lamp and a disgruntled salad, he noticed a familiar face or rather appendage. Blurp was huddled in a corner, tentacles wrapped around himself protectively, eye stalks darting nervously around the room. Feeling a twinge of guilt and maybe a touch of mischief, Jake decided to extend an olive branch. He plopped down across from Blurp, whose eye stalks nearly tied themselves in knots as he recoiled. Hey there, buddy, Jake said cheerfully. No hard feelings about yesterday, right? I mean, you did kind of volunteer me for a potentially fatal experiment, but hey, that's just good old-fashioned academic curiosity. Blurp's skin cycle threw a rainbow of colours before settling on a sickly green. W want, death worlder, come to finish the job. Turn me into a singularity like you did to the classroom floor. Jake couldn't help but laugh, which only made Blurp shrink further into himself. Relax, Blurp. If I was going to turn you into a singularity, I'd at least buy you dinner first. Speaking of which, he gestured to his tray. Any idea what this stuff is? I'm pretty sure my salad just winked at me. Despite his fear, Blurp's curiosity got the better of him. He leaned forward slightly, eye stalks examining Jake's meal. That's Andromedian flux fruit, he said, pointing to the lava lamp-like substance. It's supposed to adapt its nutritional content to the consumer's needs. The winking salad is probably Mercurian mimic lettuce. It uh, tries to communicate with its eater. Jake prodded the salad with his fork, and the leaves rustled in what sounded suspiciously like a giggle. Ha! Huh. On Earth we usually prefer our food a little less. Interactive. But when in Rome, right. He speared a leaf and popped it into his mouth. Immediately his eyes widened. Whoa! It tastes like everything, all at once. Blurp, his fear momentarily forgotten in the face of Jake's reaction, leaned in closer. Really? Mercurian mimic lettuce is supposed to taste different to every species. What does everything taste like to a death welder? Jake chewed thoughtfully, his face a canvas of conflicting emotions. It's like, imagine if you took every meal you've ever had, blended it together, 
then had that mixture described the concept of flavour to an alien who's never eaten before. Using interpretive dance, it's confusing, a little overwhelming, but somehow not entirely unpleasant. As Jake continued to describe his culinary adventure, he noticed Blurp gradually relaxing. The alien's tentacles uncurled, and his eye stalks were now focused on Jake with something akin to fascination rather than fear. You know, Blurp said hesitantly, for a terrifying deathworlder, you're not as. Well, terrifying as I thought. Don't get me wrong, you're still a walking disaster zone, but at least you're a funny one. Jake grinned, raising his glass of what he hoped was water but suspiciously resembled liquid starlight. Thanks, Blurp. Coming from you, that's practically a love confession. Cheers to new friendships and hopefully fewer classroom demolitions. As they clinked glasses, Jake carefully moderating his strength to avoid shattering them, a commotion at the cafeteria entrance caught their attention. Professor Zilk's knacks oozed in, his gelatinous form practically vibrating with excitement. Mr. Martinez, the professor, called out, oblivious to the way nearby students flinched at his volume. I've been looking everywhere for you. You'll never believe what the Board of Galactic Education has decided. Jake exchanged a wary glance with Blurp. Ah, uh, why do I get the feeling I'm not going to like this? Professor Zilk's knacks reached their table, eye stalks quivering with barely contained glee. Like it? My dear boy, you're going to love it. The board was so impressed with yesterday's unconventional demonstration that they've decided to fast-track a new course practical applications of death world of physiology in extreme cosmic environments. Jake blinked his fork hovering halfway to his mouth. That's great. But why do I feel like there's an air and coming? And the professor continued, either missing or ignoring Jake's apprehension. They want you to be the primary test subject. Just think of the scientific advancements we could make, the mysteries of death world adaptation we could unravel. Blurp, surprising both himself and Jake, spoke up. Uh, professor, isn't that a bit... Dangerous? I mean, yesterday was just a classroom. Imagine what could happen in extreme cosmic environments. Professor Zilk's knacks waved a dismissive tentacle. Nonsense. Mr. Martinez here has proven that death welders are practically invincible. Why, I've already drawn up plans for our first practical exam surviving a supernova, a hands-on approach. Jake choked on his liquid starlight. I'm sorry, did you say supernova? The professor's enthusiasm was undeterred. Oh, don't worry, my boy, we'll start small. Perhaps a white dwarf or a mild black hole first. We'll work our way up to the supernova. Can't rush science, after all. As Professor Zilk's knacks launched into a detailed explanation of his plans, complete with disturbingly vivid gesticulations, Jake caught Blurp's eye. The alien's expression was a mix of sympathy and amusement. Still feeling invincible, Death Wilder Blurp asked, a hint of his old snark returning. Jake slumped in his seat watching as his salad attempted to crawl off his plate in what he could only assume was an act of solidarity. You know, suddenly those Zentorian plasma jelly burns are looking pretty good. Hey, Blurp, any chance your species is looking for exchange students? Preferably on a nice, boring, non-lethal planet. Blurp's laughter, a sound somewhere between a squeaky toy and a malfunctioning garbage disposal, echoed through the cafeteria and as Jake resigned himself to his fate as Galactic University's premier death world a guinea pig, he couldn't help but smile. Sure, he might be facing certain doom on a daily basis, but at least he was making friends and influencing alien life forms along the way. After all, isn't that what college is all about? Epilogue. Droog. Six months later, the Galactic University campus had undergone some significant renovations. The new death world are studies, Building was a fortress of reinforced neutronium, surrounded by a moat of liquid nitrogen and guarded by a very nervous-looking plutonium pulsating pitcher plant which had developed a peculiar twitch whenever it heard Jake's voice. Jake, now sporting a few new scars and a t-shirt that read I survived a black hole, and all I got was this lousy shirt had become something of a campus legend. Students from across the galaxy applied to Galactic University just for a chance to witness the invincible Earthling in action. Professor Zilksnacks had published no fewer than twelve papers on death world of physiology, each more outlandish than the last. His latest work, Quantum Tunneling a Death World as Shortcut Through Space-Time, was met with equal parts academic acclaim and existential dread. As for Blurp, he had undergone a transformation of his own. 
No longer the class bully, he had appointed himself Jake's unofficial bodyguard, though whether he was guarding Jake from the universe or the universe from Jake was a matter of some debate. He could often be heard regaling wide-eyed freshmen with tales of that time Jake sneezed and accidentally created a wormhole. And so, life at Galactic University continued, forever changed by the presence of one accident-prone death worlder. The campus might have been a bit more battered, the professors a bit more frazzled, and the laws of physics a bit more flexible, but one thing was certain higher education in the galaxy would never be the same again. As Jake liked to say, usually while standing in the smoking ruins of the latest failed experiment that's one small step for a death worlder, one giant leap for interstellar property insurance claims. And somewhere in the depths of space, on a planet so dull it made watching paint dry seem like an extreme sport, a galactic university recruitment officer looked down at his list of potential planets for the next exchange program. His tentacle hovered over Earth for a moment before quickly moving on. Once was enough, even for a galaxy that prided itself on cosmic diversity. Some things, it seemed, were better left to the realm of legend, or at least, to planets with significantly higher safety standards and much, much stronger building materials. The end. Or is it just the beginning of humanity's misadventures in galactic academia?